We can all make up a number for how much we think basketball stars should or shouldn't make. It's really subjective. However, I think that an athlete whose name is on the back of jerseys, shows up on national television, and has their face on stadium banners should be making more than what I make as a content creator. But on average, they aren't. The average WNBA player makes about $113,000 a year. Maybe you think that's low, maybe you think it's high. For me, I consider that pretty low for an elite professional athlete. But why is that the number? Why is that the average? And just for some perspective, the average NBA salary hovers around $10.7 million. I'm Hannah Williams, and I ask people what they do for a living and how much they make. I created Salary Transparent Street to bring pay equity to all industries and careers, but I realized that there's no greater pay in equity than in the WNBA. Before I picked up a microphone to ask people how much they make, I wanted to work in sports. In college, I worked for the Washington Nationals, and I interned with the Washington Commanders and Georgetown's basketball team. I really enjoyed the sports, but working for the teams was a totally different story. Bad work-life balance, unpaid internships, it just didn't seem like a sustainable career for me outside of school. So I left, but I remained a fan. Salaries are dictated by a collective bargaining agreement between the WNBA and the Women's National Basketball Players Association, or the Players Union, just as the NBA does through their own CBA with their Players Union. In the CBA, there are minimum salaries and maximum salary caps. A salaried veteran player in 2023 made a minimum of $62,285 and could have made a maximum of $234,936 in a Supermax contract for those superstar players. These salaries go up by a few percentages every year. For your own reference, the minimum salary of an NBA player is oh, around a yeah. million dollars. Okay. So how are those numbers decided? The NBA has similar structures with the minimums and maximums. Their numbers are dictated by a key component of their CBA, where 50% of the total revenue of basketball-related income is shared with the players through salaries. In the WNBA, that revenue split doesn't exist in the same way. Here's Lorraine Etienne, a lawyer, a one-time NBA agent, and former basketball player at Sacred Heart University to explain. So the league has to surpass cumulative growth targets. So if you don't meet the cumulative growth target, you don't share the revenue. If the target's met, then 25% goes directly to player compensation, another 25% goes to the league marketing agreement pool, which is then distributed among the players. So the league has to see 20% revenue growth every year. The other wrinkle in that is anytime there's a shortfall from that 20%, that shortfall is added onto the next year's target. This is the thing players bring up when they talk about equal pay. They are asking for Steph Curry level salaries. We're asking to get paid the same percentage of revenue shared. Okay. You know uh, what I'm got saying? It, got it. So that's a huge misconception. That's a huge misconception. Yeah. Got it. Okay. For sure. So why doesn't the WNBA split league revenue with the women the same way the NBA does with the men? WNBA doesn't release revenue numbers officially, but that hasn't stopped this rumor from floating around. The WNBA doesn't make So, how did that narrative start? And more importantly, is it true? Since 2018, the NBA commissioner, Adam Silver, and team owners have gone on record saying the WNBA is losing upwards of $10 million a year. This is the first thing people point towards when talking about this issue negatively. It was estimated that the WNBA's revenue was $60 million by this guy. They say, look, we're not really doing that well. Okay, are you not doing, how do we know that? David Barry, an author and sports economics professor at Southern Utah University. I knew what their television deal was. I knew what their minimum ticket prices were. I knew how many tickets they sold. Um, and I knew there were other deals. So I made a guess at the time that they were earning $60 million a year. That revenue number puts the percentage towards salaries at approximately 25%. Turns out 
his revenue estimate was actually way under. The players picked up on that. They're like, we're getting 25%, NBA's getting 50%, this is really a bad deal. At the time, I, and I didn't know this, the NBA, when they told Bloomberg, we're making 180 to 200 million this year, they also said in 2019, which was around the time I was writing, we made 100 million. Oh, you're making 100, I thought it was 60, it's really 100. Okay, that's different. That's a big difference. So you weren't paying the players 25%. You were paying them about 10%. That's what you're doing. And now your revenues have doubled and you're still paying 10%. David suggests that the WNBA is using this narrative that the WNBA doesn't make any money, that it's not profitable, or that it's a charity as a negotiation tactic to pay players less. And I think what the NBA's learned is that in negotiating with players, if you tell them they're losing money, the players won't ask for very much. The WNBA formed within the NBA in 1996. The NBA started in 1946. So how do the revenue splits compare historically? If you go back to the history of the NBA, uh, we know what the players were paid uh, early on because Congress did an investigation of professional men's sports leagues in the 1950s. So they investigated the NBA and the NHL and the NFL and Major League Baseball and they required that you, they said you have to turn over your financial statements to us. Tell us what your revenues are, tell us what your player salaries are. If you go back and you look at the data you can see the NBA in the 1950s when the league was about 10 years old was paying between 35 to 45 percent of their revenue to their players. Now at that time the NBA in today's dollars was making about 15 million in revenue. So they were about 10 to 20 percent the size of the WNBA today. I mean it was a tiny tiny league. They had no fans. Despite that it was still paying more than 10 percent. They were not paying 10 percent. They were paying 35 to 45 percent. WNBA players frequently play overseas as a way to supplement their income. You probably heard about Brittany Griner being detained in Russia. She wasn't there on vacation. She was there to work. Countries like China, Russia, South Korea, and Turkey all pay players significantly larger salaries than the WNBA. 250000 in Turkey, 300000 to 900000 in China, and 500000 to $1.5 million in Russia. The business model overseas is different. In the United States, professional sports are usually run on a profit maximization model, while overseas teams run on a win maximization model, which basically means team owners in Europe will pay a lot of money for the best players available for hiring. The pay is so much better overseas that almost half of the WNBA's 144 players were overseas. But, you should know, not all players are making that much money overseas. It's not all six-figure numbers. In Italy, I'm making 90, 90,000, yeah. Robin Parks of the Chicago Sky has been playing overseas long before she was drafted into the WNBA. She's played in Mexico, Italy, Spain, Angola. My first year overseas is crazy. I made $1,500 a month, like. Just being real, like, yeah, $1,500 a month, so. Um, yeah, and I feel like that's probably um, way more frequent than not. Robin said that when you get into the WNBA, that's what bumps your overseas pay. The trade-off is players will have to play back-to-back -back seasons with little to no rest in between. The WNBA plays in the spring and summer, while overseas, they play in the fall and winter. The timing works out for now. It's very difficult and it's crazy because I've actually I've been doing it like I haven't been in the W but even after my European seasons were in I would go to like countries like Angola or like just um, Egypt like different places Mexico plant still playing in the summer so I was playing year round but it's still very different because even after those seasons would be over I would have about probably like anywhere between like two to four weeks and still like you know like relax recover before my next season but Shoot, it was kind of like after the WNBA season ended, like my team in Italy needed me like almost like immediately, like right away. So 
This year was probably the toughest as far as like transition wise going from season to season. There are obvious risks to playing back to back seasons. As an elite athlete, your body needs to rest following a season. Without rest, your body is more prone to injury, and the NBA knows this. In the current CBAs for both the NBA and the WNBA, there's a whole list of things players are prohibited from doing. There's a lot of overlap. We've got skydiving, flying aircrafts, riding motorcycles, and boxing. But there's one thing both contracts don't have in common. NBA players cannot participate in any game or exhibition of basketball, football, baseball, hockey, lacrosse, or other team sport or competition. However, WNBA players can. And let's not forget the time spent away from home. These seasons overseas take place during the winter holidays, which means that players are missing valuable family time back home. Being away means players have less time to promote the WNBA, cultivate an audience, and grow a generation of fans. You want the league, you want the players in the offseason around to be doing interviews. Uh, but I mean, there's a simple, there's a, you know, a very simple example of, of, of the Washington Mystics won a WNBA title, didn't get a parade because we can't have a parade. I live in We're DC leaving. and I remember uh, asking myself, yeah. why is there no parade? I, they win the championship, and the next day it's like, I have a job in Europe, I have to go, they need me there. One thing the WNBA will see play out in the 2024 season is the beginning of a prioritization clause in the CBA. Starting next year, players who are late to training will be fined, and players who are late to the start of the official season will be exempt from the season. The WNBA is ultimately saying that it wants its players to, as the name suggests, prioritize the WNBA season over any overseas play. With some country seasons spilling over into the WNBA season, playing overseas might no longer be an option. So with that extra income being possibly severed, and their salaries only changing incrementally, that specifically, that definitely makes it seem like the W doesn't want his players to go overseas. But then it's like, if you want to keep us here, then, or yeah, if you want the players to stay stateside, if you want them to be obligated to their W teams, that's fine. But you have to, you know, compensate them for that or compensate us for that. So, yeah. yeah. Do we think that the WNBA is really going to enforce that? You're going to tell them that they can't play for the entire year when you know that your business model is being built off of the stories and the stars, I don't know. <laughs> Lorraine also wrote a paper about why it's time for the WNBA to pay up, but it's also time for private mediation between the NBA and the WNBA. This is the time to make the investment. This is how you get the best return on your investment. And you get to be on the side of history where it's like, you know, we saw this going, we made our mark right here and then it takes off, the trajectory is amazing, and then you get to be a part of the story where it was like, this was the push that the WBA needed and the players needed to really cement their legacies. Cause at, like, at the end of the day, these are incredible women athletes, like incredible athletes. After getting into the weeds of the CBA, the mechanics of pay in the WNBA, and the comparative history of both leagues, it's clear to me that there is too much short-term thinking in an industry that is very much a long-term product. The NBA took decades and decades to build it to where it is today, and the WNBA will need time to build as well. What remains unfair is the sacrifices players have to make to earn a decent living in this industry, and the revenue split compared to their male counterparts. I obviously think that having these numbers out in the open is helpful. Sharing this information brings more awareness to the situation, and it helps fans just like you and me advocate for them to help them get what they deserve. Some people, they might be getting the short end of the stick and they don't even know it because like they're not talking to other people like around them or people who have maybe been in the position that they're trying to get to or that they're in now. Like, in situations like that, that's where I feel like definitely talking about salaries is beneficial. What do you think about pay inequity in the WNBA? And is there a salary story you'd like us to cover next? Let us know in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe and we'll see you next time.